They hate. They hate. They hate. They hate. They, they hate because they fear. They hate because they fear. Because they fear. Because they fear. And they fear because they feel that the deepest feelings of their lives are being assaulted and outraged. They do not know why. They are powerless pawns. Powerless pawns. They are powerless pawns in, in a, a blind. blind play of social forces. Richard Wright. From Mauhaus Productions. A Blind Play of Social Forces Episode 6 Silence The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. William Butler Yeats, The Second Coming. And there I am, sweating on a bench in front of Piggly Wiggly, watching two elderly men, one black, skinny as a pole in his scarecrow suit, one white, his filthy overall stretched out in front of him, march down the sidewalk, one after the other. The white man pats the black man squarely on the back before moving his slow legs across the parking lot towards me. The black man tips his hat. Annoyed crows hop away as they pass them, returning to their treat afterwards. The black man continues on up the road, holding his hat down on his head against the traffic. I'm on a break at work, and Donna in the deli has fried some chicken and mashed some potatoes, a feast to help me forget the hours of stocking shelves ahead of me. With a cold Coca-Cola and a lemon pie resting on my red apron, I am a portrait of the South. I've brought a book to read, but the heat has turned my banquet into sleeping pills. So by the time the old guy has limped his way to the bench, I am two breaths away from a nap. I feel him sit, but that isn't enough to rouse me. A click and a deep inhale and I am wearing his cigarette smoke. I look at him. I give him a half smile. And he sucks his teeth. They shouldn't have killed him. He proclaims indignantly. And I know that a lecture will follow. It's the way of the South. It's an unwritten rule. If one of your elders makes a proclamation, even if said elder is a complete stranger, a speech will follow, and you will listen. <clears throat> And I do. And, uh, thrown everything off balance. Shouldn't have killed him. Who? Asks the polite southern boy who just wanted to take a break from stocking cans of snuff. Martin Luther King. He announces. As if I should know. <sighs> I was born in Georgia. And I grew up in Alabama and Tennessee. When I was 12 or 13... My grandmother openly questioned food science history during Black History Month when she flapped a copy of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution in my face and said, You see here, it says a n invented peanut butter. Can you believe that? A n George Washington Carver, the man Time Magazine called the Black Leonardo, the president of the Tuskegee Institute, but to my granny, he was just a <laughs> So when a man about my grandmother's age mourns the death of Martin Luther King openly in front of a piggly wiggly in the center of Alabama, it gets my attention. Yeah, I say. 
I want him to know that I'm listening, that we're on the same page here. They hadn't killed him. We wouldn't have all those up eating <laughs> thinking they're better than us. Whoa, not on the same page. <clears throat> not on the same page. Yeah. Uh, if you just let him live, he's shown everyone the <laughs> he really was. <laughs> uh, they had to go and make a martyr of him. Martin Lucifer Coon. <laughs> Hearing that hateful moniker, I am transported from that grocery store bench and dropped onto a bench 20 miles and 12 years away. It was one of those summers where the blacktop gets so hot it nibbles on kickstands until bikes collapse. I had spent much of that summer with chicken pox, living in the walk-in cooler of my mom's flower shop in Birmingham, playing with G.I. Joes. The cold helped with the itching, but solitary confinement and a strict don't-touch-the-flowers policy left me itching to escape. Luckily, right across the parking lot, the slurpy machine at the 7-Eleven promised both adventure and relief. A handful of quarters from the cash register and I was racing across the parking lot, my shoes making kissing sounds as they pulled away from the hot tar. Just feet from the doors, a piece of rebar climbing its way out of the congealed darkness grabbed my foot. A spray of coins ricocheted off of cars as I, looking like I was dodging gunfire, landed knees and palms on the ground. I lay there stunned and watched the sweat drip off my nose. A shadow moved over me, and a voice from above asked, Hey, you okay there? As I rolled onto my back, a hand reached down and took my wrist. I was hoisted up and planted safely on my feet. Quite a spill you took, said the thin, bearded man with eyes that looked like what I would imagine my grandfather's eyes did. Hey, have a seat, he said, and ushered me to a bench near the door to the 7-Eleven. Now take a load off. I don't know why I couldn't speak to him. Maybe I was in shock. Maybe it was because he was dressed like a preacher. Maybe my mother's lessons about talking to strangers were having an effect. Instead, I focused on my hands, scraping grit out of my palms. Where are you off to in such a hurry, mister? His hand was on my back. Not, not my shoulder, but pressed into the center of my back. I pointed to the door and managed to get out. Slurpee? What's a Slurpee? I explained it was a kind of drink that's mostly ice. Oh, uh, good for a hot day like today, huh? I nodded and then scanned the parking lot for my quarters. Well, it's been hotter, but not by much. It was as if the asphalt had swallowed them. Hey, you want to learn a song? I was still on the hunt for anything that shimmered in the sun, but I heard him. I heard him, but... The question itself seemed so foreign, I, I just didn't respond. It's a good one, he said, now patting my back. Okay. I was expecting a hymn, like the ones my grandmother was always singing as she cooked. You know, uh, nearer my God to thee, or a mighty fortress is our God. Well, it goes like this. A fight, a fight, a and a white. The white jump win, we all jump in. He tapped it out on my back. But it still didn't sound like a song. He repeated himself to make sure I'd heard it. The white don't win, we all jump in. And here it comes. Right here. That moment where I asked the question and got the answer. I really wish I hadn't. What's an... He seemed stunned at first. 
But then he folded his beard, straightened his tie, and he said, Well now, a n- is a very bad person. Like a robber? Sure, some n- the robbers. And the head n- was named Martin Lucifer Coon, but we got him. He sang his song one more time, this time holding my knee and bouncing it like a ball to his evil anthem. A fight, a fight, a n- ran a white. The white don't win, we all jump in. The chicken pox on my stomach began to itch terribly, and I stood up to walk back to the flower shop without my treat. Hey, what about your slurper? I just dropped my money. He reached into the pocket of his brown pants and pulled out a five-dollar bill. He waved it at me and said, Hey, go get me one of those slurpers, too. I did, and I returned to my mother with more money than I'd borrowed and a red grin. Whether it was because the song was about fighting or because that word just didn't feel right in my mouth... I knew I couldn't share what I'd learned with my parents. That didn't stop me from taking my song on tour around the playground when school started the next month. It became our cheer, my eight-year-old friends and I, until a teacher heard us and told us never to say things like that again. Do you know what that word means? She asked. I told her what it meant. And she sent me to the principal, who called my mom. And I can still hear my mother's voice as the overalled man at the Piggly Wiggly spits his vitriol. She's disappointed in me. She's telling me about hate and racism and her mother's generation. If you ever see that man again, you let me know and I'll let him know what happens to old men who talk like that to children. She'd told me 12 years earlier. And he's right next to me. Or some version of him. And mom's not here to step in. And I hear my sweet grandmother talking about roving bands of at the park. And how the KKK saved so many white women. And she feeds me homemade chocolate cake with cold milk. And she tells me about Jesus, who loved everyone than who died for our sins. Instead of telling the fat man who spoiled my break that he's an ignorant, scared fool, instead of telling him I don't agree with him, instead of standing up and walking away, I just stare out at the parking lot. My watch beeps. My break is over. I take the last swallow of Coke, and I stand up. And he stands up. Name a book, he says, extending his hand. I don't slap it down. I don't spit on it. I don't ignore it. I shake it. I shake that man's hand, and I say, Nice to meet you. I walk back into work to shelve baby food and cleaning supplies, and I know that in my silence, I am that pockmarked little boy teaching his third-grade pals prejudiced propaganda. In my silence, I am worse than my grandmother. Worse than old Buck. Worse than the 7-Eleven Slurpee Man. See, they may have been bigots and racists. But man, at least they stood up for their backwards beliefs. Silence was written and directed by Michael Mao. 
It stars Michael Mao as the narrator, Blake Fowler as Buck, Paul Fegan as the Slurpy Man, Krista Burton as the grandmother and the teacher, and Shenandoah Evans as mom. Trevor Tremaine composed our theme music. Cover art by Geneva Hicks. Sharmarki Purcell reads the epigraph. Additional sound effects by Pixabay. To find out more about the cast, to read the original short story, or to donate to the show so we can make an unforgettable second season, visit us at a blindplaypodcast.com or on Instagram at Malhouse Productions. I was recently able to work with a wonderful group of people at the Atlanta Radio Theater Company. And if you're looking for a new podcast, may I suggest Mercury, a broadcast of hope. Put out by the Atlanta Radio Theater Company, this podcast is a different kind of zombie story. Available where you found a blind play of social forces. Coming in one week, Episode 7, Papa and Eyes, Two Stories from Inside a Classroom. If you aren't already, please follow the show. Your podcast app should have a follow button. Click it. And please rate and review. Ratings and reviews are the lifeblood of podcasts, and they take so little time. Just click those five stars. Tell us about your favorite episode. Share with friends and family. And thank you for listening.